Well, we'd like to welcome all who may be tuning in to our Bible study for this week. In the midst of all the chaos that's going on in the world, we still do not need to uh, refrain from doing our regular Christian routine. In fact, if anything else, we probably should increase our routine because it's certainly in what we get from God's Word uh, that strengthens us for everything that we go through. We are doing a verse-by-verse -verse consideration of the book of James, and tonight we're going to begin with James chapter 2. Before we begin, we'll open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We come before you humbly, Father. We know that around the world at this time that you are hearing many prayers. People who are anxious, people who are full of fear, people who are perplexed, people who are just questioning why things are happening the way that they are. There may be people, Father, who right now are praying for loved ones who are very ill and sick. And in, in the midst of their storms, Father, they're calling out to you. But as these things are, are, are turning and as you hear every, every prayer, uh, we pray, Father, that you give attention to our Bible study. We pray, Father, that in it we'll find something that can touch us and benefit us. And we pray, Father, that you will indeed bless us all as we continue to be as steadfast and unmovable, always having plenty to do in your work. Even though we may be restricted in some ways, uh, Father, we will not faint, we will not tire, and we will continue faithful to you. Bless our study. We pray for your Holy Spirit, your guidance, and your direction. We pray for your will and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, as we mentioned, we're going to be considering James chapter 2. And we're just going to consider the first uh, 13 verses tonight. And we'll finish the rest of the chapter next week. In fact, this whole theme is about uh, not showing partiality toward those who maybe have, have more, the rich. Uh, those who may have stout or position or rank. Um, not being a, a type of person who's going to greedily look to what we can benefit from as we look at our brothers and sisters in the faith. And this is something we all have been guilty of. Almost every church, in some respect, has been guilty of it. In fact, there's been many a pastor who has made decisions based on finances. And really, when it comes to making decisions in the church, we should only make decisions based on what we feel the Spirit leads. And many times, because we serve a God who wants us to have faith, some of our decisions will absolutely have no finance at all in it. Because the Spirit is leading us to do something that is impossible from a human perspective and from a financial perspective. But because we have faith, those mountains are moved, and we are able to, to do what God is wanting us to do. And so James being, a, a, as we have established in, in, in our introduction of James, James being uh, an individual who was very much inclined to help the needy, to help the poor, to help those in financial problems, uh, James really, throughout his entire book, including tonight, uh, brings up the subject of helping the poor and not being prejudiced toward the poor, but rather extending an open hand. And so in tonight's uh, reading, we're going to consider that. We're first of all going to read verses 1 through 6, or I'm sorry, 1 through 7, and then we'll pause there, talk about it, and then proceed with the other six verses. So we'll read James chapter 2. Verses 1 through 7. Would you like to read? My brothers, show no partiality <coughs> as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus, 
the Lord of glory. For if men wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in a shabby clothes also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made the stream among yourself and become judged with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and hers of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppose you and the ones who drag you into the court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Amen. So James really, he, he starts out by uh, giving some very strong admonition to the church. Uh, and he's very forceful. He's throwing uh, uh, questions at him, rhetorical questions. Um, it, you almost hear a sense of a, of a judgment in his, in his verbiage, in the way he's speaking to the church. Uh, in fact, he, sits, he, he begins by saying, my brothers, or my brethren, he said, don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Um, you know, that there's a sin. This is a sin. When we're partial and we're prejudiced toward the rich, they call that uh, prosopolipsia. A big, long word. But that's what that is. The sin of prospolipsia. Pros, <laughs> can you say it now? Prosopolipsia. And, and that's what it means. It, it basically means you are showing favoritism. Toward someone of, of, a, of a, that, that, that can economically or in some other way benefit you. It's actually a form of selfishness. Because if we're, all, if we're showing partiality toward those who can benefit us, we're only looking out for ourselves. We're not looking out for others. We're not looking out for the best interest of the church. And so he's basically saying, you know, don't, don't even connect the glorious name of Jesus. Don't connect that at all with showing favoritism, showing partiality. Don't connect it. You can't say that you are of the faith, that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that you follow the gospel of, the Je of Jesus if this is something that you're inclined to do. In fact, he says here, I think it's interesting when you look at the breakdown of the language here, he said, hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this, in, 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 in there's a comment, it says, the Lord of glory. Um, if you look at the, the margin in the Greek, basically James here is calling Jesus glory. You know, we, we call Jesus what? The way, the truth, and the life. Here Jesus is called glory. He is glory. Mm -hmm. And so, he don't just possess glory, or we don't just give him glory. He is glory. And we can't sit here and say that we are a follower of Jesus, that we are part of the faith, if we're taking some of the same people who are partaking of that glory, mm -hmm. we're taking some of them and, 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 and either putting them up on a pedestal or we're taking others and putting them below a footstool. We, we all get the same glory. In fact, that's what's really shown in this first statement is the equality of all Christians. Uh, in fact, anybody who's under the name of Jesus, um, we have a common faith, we have a common Lord. And, and that glory has been bestowed upon all, and we all equally partake of it. And so to put a distinction between someone, uh, whether they're greater or put a, a lower distinction upon them, 
is truly a sin. And, and I would grant to say it is a sin. It's something that probably insults Jesus because his blood paid for it all. And here we're basically uh, counting someone that he paid for as less. And so notice it says here, For if there should be into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. Notice the question he asked, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, some are thinking that this assembly is talking about the church. And, and we could make a reference to that. That could happen in the church. But remember, James was talking to primarily who? A bunch of, of Jews who had become Christians. Mm -hmm. And even though they were Jews that Jewish Christians, and they went and they worshiped together in each other's homes, many of them still, because of their background, would go into the synagogues and listen to the, the people read from the, from the old, old Covenant. They would read from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They would still do that. And, and I, I guess you could say there was nothing wrong with it, per se, if they're going there to hear the Word of God. Yeah. Um, but many times these synagogues or these places of assembly was set up as like a court. When there was issues going on where, where there was uh, a, a, a division or something that needed to be met and somebody needed to make a judgment on it, they would go into these assemblies. And I think this is what it mainly has reference to. You have a, a rich man with a gold ring going into the, the court, you could say, all dressed up in fine apparel, nice clothes, and then there's somebody that comes in in filthy clothes. They're dirty. They're, they're, they're scrabby. They're, there's holes in their clothes. And it says, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here. I'm going to give you a good place. In fact, that little bench has a cushion on it. All right? But then the poor man who's coming to, for judgment, who's coming for justice, he, he, he may not even be able to sit on the footstool. He may have to sit on the floor. Or, better yet, we're going to see it in a little bit in a few minutes, or it says here, you stand there. Maybe he's not even allowed to sit down. Now, you know, it has been said, um, and it's sad, you, you read these stories, that there have been churches who kind of cater to the wealthy, cater to the rich. In fact, you go into the church and there's placards, because somebody gave $10,000 to the building fund, they got this nice plaque with their name on it. Or in certain churches, when, when members who gave a lot of money died, they'll take a chair and they'll put it somewhere and they'll put the person's picture and name on it for recognition because this person was a big donor to the church. And then you, you have... That situation where you clearly see people giving rec too much recognition to gifts. But then you see a homeless individual come in. And because they, they may stink or they haven't had a bath. They're told, you know, well, you, you can't stay here. You're not allowed to stay. There have been churches that have pushed people away because of their status, because of their stature, because of their position. And, and this really hits this hard here. I mean, if somebody, that I, a, two complete strangers walk in and one walks in looking like a million bucks and then the other walks in looking like a homeless person and you got the same people giving favoritism to the one who looks like they have a million bucks. Why? Because they think that when the plate's going to be passed, they're going to get a big contribution from that person. So they extend all the hospitality in the world. Oh, come and sit up here near the pastor. 
Give them, you know, let the, oh, oh, you're up, oh, oh. In fact, why don't you just come up here and sit in the pulpit with the pastor? You know? Especially, let's say you got a, a politician who maybe never goes to that church, but he walks in one day. Now, all of a sudden, they're sitting up in the pulpit next to the pastor. Why? Because of who they are. But yet another stranger can walk in. And they may not even get an usher to, to, to direct them to a seat. We have that happening. It, it still happens. It's a sad sin. It's a sin to show partiality toward people based on a judgment we make about their outward apparel. We should never, ever, ever make such a judgment. It's not Christian. It's not right. It's something... Here, the, 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 the half-brother of Jesus was disgusted by it. And he threw these questions at him. He said, if you're doing that, if you're, 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 you know, here you are letting the people with the gold ring. See, back in the day, if uh, wearing a, a ring on the finger was a, and having splendid guards was proof of a man's opulence. What's opulence mean? It means their uh, extravagant wealth. Only people who were extravagantly, extravagantly wealthy wore rings. Now today, poor people like me wear rings. Here in America, people can be poor. You got homeless people wearing rings here. Okay? I see homeless sometimes with rings. You don't have to be wealthy to wear a ring here. But during James' time, only people with extraordinary wealth. In fact, it was mainly the, the kings and the emperors that wore rings. And if you had someone who was a non-politician that wore a ring, it was because they were extravagantly wealthy. And so you got somebody coming in with a gold ring on his, on his hand, oh man, we got to give him the good seat. We got to give him the good place. We got to put him in a, in a position because he might bless us. Oh, he might even put that ring in the plate. Right? Because we want to extend all the hospitality and show all the kindness so that they'll come back and keep giving us money. Again, the purpose of assembling together in worship, the purpose of coming together in anything is not to collect money. That's the last thing. We, we do need money. Every ministry needs money. But that's not the purpose of coming together. You come together to worship. You come together to expound on the Word of God. Mm -hmm. If a collection is, is made, then so be it. If not, so be it. But there's nowhere that says that a collection has to be made at every service. You know? Um, but people have really taken things. and I don't see how churches today could be so, so much into this favoritism stuff knowing that this is in the Word. It's pretty, bl it's pretty blunt here in the Word, telling us not to do that. All right, in verse 5, he said, Listen, my beloved, has God not chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Yes, there in verse 5. I think it's interesting there. It says, uh, has, not God, has not God chosen the poor? Let's look at this. Take, turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 5. Matthew chapter 11, verse 5. You can read that if you'd like. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are clean and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. Who specifically was receiving the gospel, the good news? The poor. The poor. In fact, when you look at the foundation of, of, of the ministry of Jesus and the church, 
the foundation of it was the poor. Gee, the Bible says the Son of Man, Jesus, didn't even have a place to lay his head. He was a carpenter's son, a poor class. Right? Most of the, uh, uh, the, the early followers of Jesus were what type of profession? Fishermen. Not only did they have a, a poor profession, but they, they stunk. Right? <laughs> They're around fish. Yeah. Right? So, the foundation of the whole gospel was not the economically rich. The foundation of it was upon those who were searching and seeking and wanting deliverance from their present situation. In it's fact, the humble people. Exactly. Um, God's choice of the poor was not just because they were impoverished. But you know what is distinctive about the poor? You know what's so distinctive about them? And if they're this way, that's why the gospel would appeal to them? Is the fact that poor people, truly poor people, have an indifference to worldly possessions. Because they don't have anything to be attached to, they're not attached to it. Right? They're not attached to having this, wanting that. Now, yes, even in the homeless communities, we find greedy people. Yeah. Okay? But, notwithstanding, for the most part, people who have never had much don't demand much. And you know what? When Jesus talked about discipleship, he told us that we were going to have to pick up a cross. We were going to have to deny ourselves. He even told us that we might lose everything we have because of him. If we lose everything we have because we follow Jesus, if we never had much to begin with, there won't be anything that's attaching us to keep it. Jesus knew that. And that's why he, he said, blessed are the poor. For theirs is the kingdom. Jesus knew that they were used to not having much. So everything they had was in their heart that he had given them. The, the, the gospel, the truth, the hope, the faith, all the things that really count in life is what they had. And no one could take that away. And so that's why he said, you know, the, the poor are the, going to be the ones to receive the word. They're going to be the ones to, to, to appreciate the word. They're going to be the ones to spread the word. There's other passages, Matthew 19, 24. Matthew 19, 24. Again, I tell you, it is easy for a camel to go through an eye of needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. There you have it. Jesus knew that people who had a lot of wealth and who depended on that wealth. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. But if you have it and you depend on it, you're going to have a problem with his theology. You're going to have a problem with his doctrine. You're going to have a problem accepting what faith is and what faith is supposed to move you to do. You know, there was a, a rich young ruler that Jesus encountered. And Jesus said, Master, what must I do to follow you? Boy, that's an open question. Jesus could have told this man a half a dozen different things. But when Jesus looked at that man and he saw the man, mm -hmm. and because Jesus could read hearts, he already knew what that man, where his love was. Mm -hmm. Jesus told him something that he didn't tell anybody else. For him, Jesus said, if you, if you not, not Peter, not John, but if you want to follow me, you're going to have to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. The man looked at Jesus 
<laughs> and said, have a nice day. <laughs> the reason why Jesus was so radical in his statement, Jesus already knew what was in that man's heart. Right. And that's the thing about wealth. You know, we have a, a, a nice home here. We have some things that some people would say, oh man, you're rich. Even though we're not. But people would say, oh, look what you have. You're rich. Well, we are in the spirit. But the thing is, it's okay to have nice things. But do you use these things to praise God? Do you use these things to share with others? Do you use these things? Do these things get in the way of your devotion and your worship and your responsibility to God? Do you rely on these things? All these things we have. If we had to walk away from it tomorrow, I would be able to leave the door and not turn back. Because I'm like, if the Lord wants me to have it, he'll give it to me again. That's the attitude we should have. If we're relying on these things, then all these things are taking precedence over our reliance on him. And that's why he said it's easier for to get through the eye of a needle, a camel to get through the eye of a needle, then it will be for a rich man to get into the into heaven. Because your heart, you're going to have to be too hearted. He said you can't slave for, for God and mammon or riches. You can't, you can't serve two masters. We can only serve one. Let's look at one final scripture on this subject, Luke 6, verse 20. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6, verse 20. This is part of the Beatitudes. That's, this was part of the Sermon on the Mount. Luke 6.20 And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. That's right. Blessed are the poor. And so, the poor are blessed because they're not rich in material things, they're rich in spirit. And certainly theirs is the kingdom of God. And if we as Christians are blessed to have more, or we're blessed to be successful in what we do, what should be our intent to do with it? Our intent should be to bless others with the blessings in which we were given. We've, we've talked about this before. If you don't use your blessing for God, your blessing will dry up. That's especially true of, of a church. If a church is blessed to have good finances and they don't ever do anything with it, eventually that finance will, 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 will dry up. You have to use your blessing. You have to be a good steward with what God has given you. If you just bury it in the ground and just hold it, and you don't do anything with it, what, what? how did Jesus talk about the master? When the master came home, what happened? He was upset. He, he condemned the slave who didn't do anything with the talent. The ones who took the talent and did something with it, they received condemnation, commendation, Right? They were commended for it. You did a good job. Good job. You know, that's what the Lord wants us to do. If he is entrusting us with, with finances, if he's entrusting us with more, then we should use it to help others. We need to be his hands. We need to be his feet. We need to be out there helping others with that which he has blessed us with. And so, really... James is, is pinpointing all of this in, in, his, in his message. Um, in fact, he even says, why are you giving favoritism to the rich? The rich are the ones who are taking you to court. Now, at the time that he said this, and he's talking to the church, what was going on with the church back then? There was persecution, mm -hmm. right? Many of the, of, the, of, the, of the rich Jewish 
people may have been Pharisees. They may have been uh, people with clout and position. They were upset that the Christians were doing what they were doing. And here you used to be one of us. You were a Jew and now you're one of them. What's wrong with you? They were being persecuted. So if they had opportunity to, uh, for, for, to use the court systems to come in and take their homes, take their property, take their wealth, take anything they had, they were doing that. And so James is saying, why are you putting favoritism toward all these rich people? These are the very ones who throw you into court. They're the ones who's against you. They're the ones who doesn't have the same faith that you have. Why? Why are you being, in the lack of better words, why are you being stupid? Right? The very ones who's really your enemy, you're trying to favor because you think you're going to get something out of them. Really showing the, the stupidity of, of their actions. And so he basically, again, is asking them these questions, like throwing it back at them. Why are you doing it? And then here was the beautiful thing he said. They, they, do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? Why in this world would we want to give favoritism toward anyone who dishonors the name of our Lord in any way? Uh, this could even be uh, applied to the church. Now you think, well, what about the rich, all the rich people in the church? Well, there could be people in the church who are there for status reasons. They're not there for faith. They're there for status reasons. Oh, well, my grandfather built this church, and he gave millions of dollars, and I am now the grandson, and I'm blah, 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 you know. And they're just a stat. Oh, they got their names are on the wall. Their placards are everywhere. It's a social club to them. You know, they give no consideration to the members who are there who maybe are of less economic status than they are. They give no consideration to them. In fact, they pro they may even discourage people who have low e uh, economic status to even be a member there. You have status club churches like that. And it's sad that that happens. And really churches like that need to be having our Bible study that we're having tonight. They need to go back to the, the words here in James and, and really see the, the, um, the disrespect and the blasphemy that they're giving to the name of Jesus. That is not the God that we, that does not represent the God that we serve in any way. Having that distinction. Our, our God came here as a man. He dwelt among us. And he was not given to a family who was of great status or economic level. He was given to a mean family. And I don't mean mean in the mean, oh, man, what does it mean? When I say mean, I'm talking about less desirable. He came from a poor family. And even from the time of his ministry, he no doubt, his stepfather had already died. And he was the prime, primary provider for his family, he being the oldest brother. He had younger brothers and sisters. And so they were poor. They were very, they were poor people. And um, it, it, it really shows you that our God not only condescended and came as a man, but he condescended even more so by coming as a poor man. And he knew that the people who would be touched by his message more than anyone else would be the poor. And his brother, who grew up poor too, Fully aware of what it meant to be a poor person, being the, the here the, the head bishop of Jerusalem, now that he's an older man, really was putting pressure on the church. Don't be like these hypocrites. Don't be these people who, who want to have status. And it's so interesting that the same problem we have today, they even had it back then in the first century. Same issues. It's like, 
I guess if the devil knows something's going to work, he, he don't stop using it. You know, it it's just amazes me that how, how much similarities that, that we have. And it just shows you the Bible is alive. It exerts power. Things really do not change. It's especially human nature and the fall of sin. The effects of that has not changed. So, very interesting. All right, let's read verses 8 through 13. It says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But, if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There's some really interesting theological points made in, the, in this section. Um, basically, when it says here, you have really fulfilled the royal law. What, what do you think the royal law is? It's quoted there. The you, royal you, law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Now, who, who gave us that royal law? Jesus. The king of king and lord of lords, right? That's why his brother called it royal law. Because mm -hmm. this was a law of Jesus. In fact, Jesus gave that command on the preface of the disciples asking him which commandment is the greatest. Thank you, sweetheart. Which commandment is the greatest? And instead of going through all ten commandments, mm -hmm. Jesus, what Jesus did was he kind of pinpointed everything on two. He gave two commandments. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, upon these two things, the whole law hangs. Okay? And so, what's interesting about Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself is if you go back, I think it was uh, in Leviticus, Israelites were commanded to love each other. Okay? But under the, the Mosaic Law, the way the law worked was if you showed your love by helping. If you had two of something, let's say, Gracie, I have two coats, and you're cold. And I give it to one to Faith. You give one to Faith, exactly. Okay? The Mosaic Law said if you had two of something and your brother needed something, you give one. Two hands. Okay? But that is yelling. Right. But the difference in Jesus, Jesus took it a step further in how we're supposed to love each other. Under Jesus' law, if you only have one coat and your sister is cold, you, could you get, give her your coat and you be the one cold. You get the blank, your blank mm -hmm. That's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. The thing that you would do for yourself, for your own... In other words, you would deny yourself because you know someone else needs what you need. That's real love. And you give it to And so James is saying, you know, that's the royal law. Us Christians are under the law of Christ. We're under the, the law of liberty, as it says here. Right. We're to love each other. We're to love each other. We're to love Amen. one another as we do ourselves, right? But he said, you say that you love your brother, but yet you show partiality. You're prejudiced. You, you have favor, favoritism toward the rich. What does he say? You commit sin. You know what? It doesn't matter that you're going out here making disciples every day like Jesus told you to do. It doesn't matter that you maybe you don't, you're not a drunkard and you don't drink anymore. 
it doesn't matter that that you don't say ugly things to people anymore. It doesn't matter well, if you don't is. kill anybody. Or it doesn't matter if you you know, here you you're not murdering anybody, you're not killing anybody, you're not committing you adultery, you're not body. committing some kind of bad sins. Okay? Those things don't matter. You can sit here and say, I'm I'm righteous. I'm doing I'm doing what's right. Like I yell faith um away my necklace for my birthday. But even though but even though you are you, you might be following what what Jesus has told us to do. If you are fa have favorites in the church and you're partial toward those who are rich, or you have a prejudice toward someone because you don't like them because they remind you of somebody who used to be mean to you, and so now you equate your hate to that person. And, you and here you have a hate in your heart for somebody, or you don't like somebody, or you have a favorite in the church. But it doesn't matter that you're being faithful in all the other things. What is James here saying? You still broke the law. You broke the law. You transgressed against the law. In fact, some people will take this scripture to mean, well, that right there proves that none of us are saved because none of us can fulfill. We can't be perfect. That's not what this means. But what, it, what drank, let, let me finish, Gracie. What James here was saying was, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. What he meant was, you may claim to be faithful in all things. You might be, you might claim to be righteous. You might claim to be. I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't. I don't. I, I don't do anything bad. I'm good, and I know I'm saved. From the but I can't. But but. I hope them stinky people don't come into the church, because we need them. the church needs some money. Let's, yeah, let's go out and find members for the church, and they're they're rich. Let's go look for rich members. If poor people come in, we'll tell them we don't have room for them. All of your righteousness is futile. All of your righteousness is in vain, because you're not being faithful in all. Remember, Jesus died for who? For everybody, right? Yeah. His blood covers everybody. He loves everybody. He wants everybody to be saved. But if we show partiality or prejudice or favoritism, we have completely discredited our whole faithfulness, our whole righteousness. <gasps> and that's not good, right? No. That's not a good thing. In fact, he goes on further, and I think this is very interesting. He says, So speak and, and do so as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. We're not under the law of Moses. We're not under the Mosaic law. We're not under the old covenant. We are under the new covenant, and that is the law of Christ, the law of liberty. Okay, that is, and that's how we're going to be judged. We're not going to be judged on did we follow the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. We're going to be judged based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You mean the Bible? Yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ primarily and what Jesus has commanded us to do. Now notice what he said. He said, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I'm going to make this statement. Mercy is showing love to the weak. Mercy is showing love to the unhappy. Mercy is showing love to the bad. That's what mercy is. Like you showed your toy to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yelling and That's jumping right. when they fall on the ground. Mm -hmm. And do not kick them in the face. That's right. That's ugly. 
Mercy is showing love to those who maybe does not deserve it. But judgment. Judgment is punishment or a severe um, sentence or condemnation. That's what judgment is. But notice what it says here. What does the scripture say? Mercy triumphs over judgment. The divine government of things, mercy contends with judgment and it overcomes judgment. And whenever mercy has, it, you could say mercy is a person and judgment is a person. Whenever mercy has triumphed over judgment, mercy rejoices that she has won. Now, if that is the good method of God, if, it, if, if it's in his order to want to show mercy, then why should we not be merciful? Why should we go against his method? It's in our character to show mercy to others. And that's the point James is making. The very people that you try to condemn, the unfortunate ones in the church, the ones who have less, the ones who maybe, maybe you have people that are sick, and the reason they're sick is because of their lifestyle. Perhaps drugs or alcoholism or other things. And here you are condemning them and judging them and not because they're not in the status and in the clout and the position. Here you are showing judgment and you're not wanting to embrace them as your, as your brother or sister. Here you are not wanting to show mercy because here they have been redeemed, they've been bought with the blood of Jesus, they've been saved, they've been sanctified, and even though they may not have everything you have, you want to be prejudiced toward them. But yet, here you are putting a judgment upon them. James is saying you can't expect God to show mercy to you. It is in God's character to show mercy. It should be in our character to show mercy. So there's a, a lot of things here that we find in these 13 verses. But we really see that there is no room in the church or in the body of Christ for any prejudice, favoritism, or partiality. God is not a respecter of persons. And he, and he not kill he, all. That's right. And he does not want us to be. And so if that is an inclination for us, certainly that is something we need to ask the Holy Spirit to work with us so that we can let go of it. Okay? All right. Well, we're now going to say a prayer. And uh, we're going to pray that everything we learned tonight, that certainly we'll take it to heart. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this study. Father, your, this, this wonderful book in the Bible has really uh, pinpointed something that we all need to work on, Father. We pray that you take away any prejudice, any favoritism, any partiality from us and help us, Father, to, to be uh, equal in our attitude, equal in our mindset, equal knowing that regardless of our status, regardless of our financial position, regardless, Father, of our rank, uh, we all can equally receive the same glory that Jesus gives. So, Father, we pray that you will work with the church to take away any divisiveness or any divisions or any prejudice and that you will keep us faithful to you in all things. Father, we realize that this pandemic continues to roar. The, the pandemic continues to go around the globe and more lives are, 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 are taken every day. More families are affected every day. More jobs have been taken away every day, Father. People have been confounded to their homes and many people are, are in their solitude or are depressed and lonely and scared and fearful and full of it's all types of, of anxieties. But I'm praying, Father, in Jesus' name, that you will bless us with your peace. 
I pray that in the midst of the storm, we will hear Jesus say, Peace be still. I pray that this storm will soon quieten, Father. And, and I know that in the chaos of all things, that's when Jesus is the most abundant. And so, Father, in this chaos that we're dealing with, I'm praying, Father, right now, that we will amply feel the presence of Jesus in our lives. And I'm praying, Father, that you will continue to protect us and bless us and, and help us to be a blessing to others. Father, I pray that all the evilness that's connected to this virus, all the evilness that has, has, has helped in the production of it and the spread of it, I pray, Father, that in Jesus' name, that, that such ones will repent of their ways. Yes, and I pray, Father, that, that people will find their peace with you. Yes, Jesus. And that this problem will soon go away. Yes, Father, but until then, we need your strength. We need your guidance. We need a spirit of a sound mind. Please, Father, give our president a sound mind. Yes, As he listens to these advisors, Father, please help him to distinguish that which is good and that which is not. Uh, what is for the betterment of most, Father. Please help him to use discernment and a sound mind and protect him, Father, as he has a lot of responsibility upon his shoulders. We love you. We thank you. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.